people, put a root canal in or two into them, uh, deprive them of vitamin C, and 30 will get cancer, 30 will get uh, heart attacks, coronary artery disease, uh, another 30 will get a chronic degenerative disease such as uh, uh, osteoporosis, uh, different types of collagen, vascular disease, lupus, uh, and, uh, and a small miscellaneous. So what you develop really depends on your genetic predisposition, how well your cells are buffered against one disease process, but designed to allow the expression of another disease process when the oxidative stress gets too high in those cells or that tissue or that part of the body. This is really profound. I know several people who have cancer and tumors, and they all have had at least one or two root canals. Some 60 years ago, Dr. Joseph Issels in Germany ran a, for lack of a better word, because I hate the word, alternative, shall we call it, uh, medicine clinic for <clears throat> advanced cancer patients, usually those in which uh, they'd already been through the mill, had everything tried, run out of money as well, out of, as, well as out of the desire to fight their disease, and they heard of the advances that Dr. Issels had at the time, he found that on the average, roughly 95% of the patients that came to him had one or more root canals or otherwise infected teeth. And so he began all his treatments with a complete, what we call, total dental revision, getting rid of all that toxicity and then proceeding with the rest of his protocol. Now, mind you, this was in 1950. Practically nobody was getting root canals back then. So you're talking about something that I can't tell you for sure what the percentage is, but I would say well less than 5% of the population, probably well less than 2% of the population was getting root canals, but 95% of the people that had these advanced cancers had the root canal. So that's a pretty strong correlation. I mean, it's just a correlation. It's not a ipso facto proof type of thing, but it's a pretty hard correlate to just completely ignore. What do you think is the answer in place of root canal? When the tooth has been violated, by that I mean when the pulp has been infected, uh, the pulp is a naturally sterile area. It should have zero pathogens in it zero toxic microbes. So when it becomes violated at all, uh, infection proceeds, and the body has just demonstrated over the years that it cannot completely resolve an internal dental infection. Now, when you get infections in your gums and surrounding a tooth, soft tissue infections, these can be addressed and these can be cured and these can be resolved. But once you violated the inside, the pulp of the tooth, uh, it can't be resolved, and you're only prolonging the inevitable by keeping the tooth. It's sad to say, but what the root canal does is it just largely detaches you from your ability to feel the pain of an infected tooth by cutting out all the nerves and the blood supply inside the tooth so that you can keep this chronic infection but no longer be made uncomfortable by its presence. Why do the dentists think that by cutting out this area that the tooth is viable? What makes it viable uh, as a standard? I don't get that part. Pardon my cynicism, but what makes it viable is a large price tag. It single-handedly sustains a huge number of dental practices, ability to pay mortgages, ability to buy cars, ability to send kids to college, and uh, as long as it remains a highly priced uh, alternative... Uh, it will retain its popularity. That, I am sad to say, is my opinion of the situation. Do you believe in cleaning your tongue every day? Do you think that that would be helpful in getting toxins out of your mouth? I think certainly that has merit. Uh, when you look at the mouth, the mouth is, uh, pardon the expression, literally a cesspool of microorganisms, both good microbes and a lot of bad microbes or pathogens. And maintaining and hygiene of the tongue is certainly one good way 
to optimize the good microbes and minimize the, uh, the pathogens that are present in the mouth and available to uh, infiltrate and colonize when an opportunity uh, is, uh, is made present, is made available. So, so I would say I can't give you a how important it is or how good it is, but certainly uh, lingual or tongue hygiene is, is good right along with just hygiene just about anywhere. You say in Primal Panacea that this form of vitamin C can really help smokers. Talk about why. Well, once again, uh, smokers are quite simply ingesting a huge amount of toxins with every cigarette. I mean, they take it into their lungs, they absorb it through the mucosal linings of their mouth and throat. They're getting an onslaught of toxins of a very wide range. I mean, uh, the, the papers I've seen, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like the longer you look, the more toxins you'll find. The other thing that's present in a lot of cigarette smokes are excess levels of what's called reactive iron. Uh, now, iron is only good for you in a very limited amount, enough to make a normal amount of blood. And above that, iron is the main... Uh, oxidative stress modulator. In other words, the more iron you have deposited throughout your body, in the arterial walls, wherever you're having oxidative stress take place, you put in more iron. You don't just additively increase the oxidative stress, you increase it exponentially. So the, uh, for someone that's played in the chem lab, the uh, iron is like a boiling stone. It, 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 gets, it gets things going, and it allows other agents that might otherwise uh, sit without any chemical activity to start rapidly oxidizing the, the, uh, the, the tissues around it. So iron, many other toxins, the, the fact that also <clears throat> over time, Smoking actually breaks down the lung tissue so that you're no longer able to get normal amounts of oxygen inside the body. All of these things I think most people can realize are going to cause not only lung cancer where they're specifically present, but if it knocks down your antioxidant levels in your body in general, then all the other toxins and microbes that are present in the mouth and elsewhere that are able to make their way to your cardiac coronary tissues, you're going to be much more likely to develop those type of atherosclerotic blockages uh, and heart attacks over time. You say that we should have our ferritin levels checked. Yes, ferritin level is an index of uh, how high the iron levels are in your body. And this is sort of a side topic, but it's a really important one because it's one that's still completely ignored to my knowledge, by medicine in general. And that is that <clears throat> the levels of iron, remember I was talking earlier about laboratory tests. Okay? Yes. Many laboratories will tell you that the normal range of ferritin or iron stores in your body is anywhere between 20 and 400 nanogram per cc or microgram per cc, I'm not sure which. Well, uh, the lower level is correct, but the other level is astronomical. I mean, you don't want an iron level above 30 or 40, much less three or 400. But what happens is we live in a society where they add iron to everything, all processed foods, supplements, you name it. Uh, we lose our access to the ways we excrete iron naturally is by induced sweating. And as a result, the vast majority of the population is iron toxic. But as I mentioned earlier, you can't or you don't ever have laboratory tests that will make 95% of the population look abnormal. Instead, they just expand the normal range until they can say, well, here's the normal test range because 95% of the people fall in it, therefore it must be normal. That's not the case. Any amount of iron in your body above which it takes to make a normal amount of blood is going to ultimately have a toxic effect. And there's a lot of data to demonstrate this. Uh, 
you know, beyond what we're talking about here in the scope of this little interview. But 